this podcast j jacob talks about analytics in security and what businesses could do to stay secure so stay tuned Welcome everyone to Future of Data podcast. Today we have an amazing guest. Jay Jacobs uh, is a data scientist at, uh, at Bitsight Technologies. Before that, he spent four years uh, as a lead data analyst on the Verizon Data Breach investigation report. Jay is also a co-founder um, of Scientia Institute, uh, a research firm advancing cybersecurity knowledge and practice through data-driven research. Jay is also co-author of Data Driven Security, a book covering data analysis and visualizations for information security. Jay is also a co-founder of the Society of Information Risk Analysts. So Jay, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Nice. So bunch of interesting keywords by the way. So data driven, security, information security. First, I think, like, why don't we start with uh, your journey uh, to this keyword? Uh, what brought you here? Sure. And, and uh, yeah, that will be amazing. Yeah, it's actually, it's a very much an evolutionary story. Uh, so I, I, it started when I was very young and it was all about trying to, you know, take things apart and see how stuff worked. And uh, uh, I grew up in a house where my dad worked for IBM. And so he was bringing home all sorts of equipment. And, you know, we got one of the first PCs when they came out in 1980. and uh, just trying to figure out how those worked. And, uh, you know, I started programming then as soon as we got a PC and, and just trying to make things work. And that just translated then into uh, working in IT and working in security, which is essentially trying to trying to stop things from working in a way that they were never intended, right? And that's pretty much what security is, a lot of what mm. security is about. And, uh, and then, so as I got into security though, um, I went in sort of an opposite direction at first. I, I got into cryptography because cryptography, mm. you know, it was like, the best solution for security out there. You can encrypt data and hand it over to an attacker and it's completely protected, right? The, the math is perfectly solid. Uh, but then I discovered that uh, math is never where any mm. of this is failing. It's it's around, around the math, you know? So you've got a key and where do you store that and how do you access it and uh, what's good enough? And that, that was a huge question about what's good enough. And that led me into this world of risk analysis. And risk analysis, led me into statistics. And so I went back to school uh, in, a, in a master's program for applied statistics. And uh, that's largely how I ended up here, uh, just sort of following, trying to figure out what, what makes this whole system, the, the internet and everything that's connected to it, what makes it work and what makes it fail and how do we stop it from failing so spectacularly as it's been doing lately. Wow, wow, I think that's, uh, uh, thank you for sharing that. So uh, let's let's talk about Scientia Institute. So what, what it is and if you can shed some light on yeah. that. So uh, it's basically a, a friend of mine and, and me uh, from the Verizon days, uh, a guy by the name of Wade Baker. We decided to start this because working at Verizon and doing the research that I did there for four years, uh, I just had so much fun working with this guy, Wade. And, uh, and he enjoyed working with me as well. And so we decided to try and kick up this, this Scientia Institute to, to continue that research, to continue working and, and researching interesting topics. And so uh, one of the things that we're working on is building up a library of uh, published research. And a lot of it is coming from security vendors and things like that. And they all have their own sort of interesting quirks and things like that. And so one of the main things we're trying to do is to bring all of that research together and, and try to do sort of a meta-analysis of the available material out there on security. And so we just finished a series on ransomware, for example, where we looked at all the published material about how often are people uh, being compromised by it? What are the average ransoms and, and the ransom amounts and how often people are actually paying the ransoms. And so trying to look at, trying to answer these sort of really tough questions uh, by looking at the, the volume of research out there. And so that's what Scientia Institute is about. We're just trying to advance the state and we're, we're helping companies do that with their own data and things like that. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the program is sponsored by Job Fair at Tau.ai. To learn more, go to Job Fair, that's J O B F A I R dot T A O dot AI. A fastest AI driven way 
to help you find your next job do check them out let's get back to the podcast interesting so um do you so so you publish reports there uh, and how frequently you do that like uh, and where, where could where could if if i want to get access to bunch of your research where we could get access so, to those scientia.com okay uh, c y e n t i a .com and uh the the ransomware series for example is a blog post a series of blog posts that we put out there um and we also have a podcast over there where we bring on people talking kind of like this and uh and and that's relatively new though we just kicked off the library i think about a month and a half ago mm-hmm. uh but you can go to the library there and you can put in a keyword and and find all the published material uh that has that type of keyword and things like that so we're it's still relatively young we just started uh, uh last year and so we've been trying to ramp it up and things like that but uh yeah scientia.com is where where it's all happening interesting and 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 let's talk about society of information risk analysts what's what's the organization and so that so that started uh what about 7 7 8 years ago uh and basically uh, me and a, a friend of mine were were talking about risk analysis and um it, a historical story came up where i was reading a book about uh, pascal and fermat and stuff like that and these mathematicians in in france and uh, how they used to the, hang out in like a coffee shop or a bar or something mm-hmm. and talk about these wonderful concepts and i was telling him how awesome it would be to like be the bartender or something oh, yeah, you know that's... to be around those conversation and uh, so we were thinking about modern day and in our current situation how in in uh, information security and risk analysis there really isn't that bar to go to you know or that coffee shop where you can right. hang out and so that's what sira and the society of information risk analysts was meant to be is meant to bring a couple of our friends together on a mailing list and uh, it, it's completely grown since then i think we're 6 700 members nice uh, on the mailing list right now so <coughs> interesting that's what it is it's basically a bunch of people getting together to talk about risk analysis and the challenges that they're facing and the the successes that they have and and, and wh- wh- where do you guys meet Um so right now it's mainly on a mailing list there's an annual conference uh the next one I think is tentatively scheduled in January mm-hmm. uh 2018 and that'll be in Seattle. Okay. And 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 primary um sort of audience for this for this com- community are wanna be analysts or analysts or uh, security experts like what what who are who all, are you? all the above. Okay. Yeah. I mean pretty much anybody working in security that has that tough question of you know how much is enough. try to right. understand that interesting interesting no i think i i i i love your your analogy about about being the bartender so i i used to remember like uh, in our in our college days so there was a there was a like very small hut kind of uh, raymond shop and this guy was mm-hmm. near our dorms and and we can just go at 2 in the night and 3 in the night and he this guy will cook raymond and what and, and and give it to us and it was funny like after a while so this guy used to talk to us about all the engineering concepts and this guy like have never been to school It's like so this guy has the best I think I I agree with you just if, if having in the middle of interesting conversations is always helpful. So yeah. yeah that's exactly. that's pretty cool. So let's talk about um uh your book so data driven mm-hmm. security. So if you can shed some light on that. Yeah, so the the security industry is you know for all of the technical advances and for how incredibly uh rich the industry is with smart people it, it's very much centered uh from an engineering discipline you know where where people have a a they look for a cause and look for that one effect from it uh and so it's it's very you know cause and effect uh from from a, a some, somewhat of a simplified environment but the reality is that it's an incredibly complex environment and the sort of cause and effect doesn't really apply Mm. as easily. And so um the the book was intended to try and get people to to think more about data analysis as a solution because it was very it it was and it still is for the most part very um gut feel driven, very driven by intuition. Uh you get these security professionals looking at this problem and saying, "Well, it, it feels like it should be this way," right? And, and that's the that's a, I think a huge challenge in the industry. And so that book is an attempt to get security people to start thinking about data analysis to be able to uh you know we talk about python and r in that book and it's all about just trying to get data bring it up in some sort of data analysis tool hmm. and start to visualize to make sense of it and so we don't get really deep in any one topic we introduce things like linear regression 
um, some machine learning, supervised, mm -hmm. unsupervised. You know, it's like I think all of those topics have either half a chapter or one chapter on those topics. And so you can imagine how, how high level we have to stay in some of those topics. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the program is sponsored by Jobfair at Tau.ai. To learn more, go to Jobfair, that's J O B F A I R, dot T A O dot A I. A fastest AI driven way to help you find your next job. Do check them out. Let's get back to the podcast. Oh, yeah, I think I, I, I totally agree. And I have a similar experience. So I wrote a book on data driven innovation. So mm. it's like getting someone to understand innovation. So without really digging too deep and it's it's such a vast field so i i do appreciate yeah. sort of uh, and and i think one thing from from my days that I, that i recall so there was like one aha moment when you're writing a book right uh, when you sort of uh, what what was that for you if 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 i if i can uh, if i so can ask my one aha moment was uh, going into it i thought it would be like writing just a long blog post <laughs> and it absolutely wasn't it was nothing like a long blog post um so that was my big one uh, moment. <laughs> I don't think that's quite what you meant, is it? No, it's it, to me. I, I think so. I, I started from blog as well, and I thought this would be like just bunch of blog posts stitched together. Yeah. But then I, I realized that writing is nothing than sort of just proof writing and just stitching this together. It's just almost like yeah. So it's it's just finally when uh, the publisher said okay. Oh, yeah. I think that's like okay. Load off. So yeah. Now let's let's talk about after after effect of and I want to stay on this topic a bit because I think that's uh, mm -hmm. it, it gave me some goosebumps to me as well because uh, yeah. so after the book is published I think the one one of the interesting uh, observation that I, I I thought was when people come back to come to you and saying hey this is what I picked and you have no freaking idea that this is what the expectation like this is what they're supposed to pick from the book right. so what are some of those um, yeah. those those uh, I, I, I hit. Uh, I think I hit the high point of feedback. Uh, what probably about three months ago, and the book has been out for over three years now. Okay. Uh, but a month ago, I was I was doing a presentation. Uh, I was down in Austin, Texas, and uh, a guy in the crowd came up and he said, "Hey, I just wanted to tell you that that your book changed my life." And I was no. like, "What? You know, this it's, is it's pretty a book cool. on data analysis. How yes. is that going to?" You know, and he said that he was he was really struggling with his career and he didn't like you know the the way that security that he thought security was being done and hmm. um, and he didn't know quite how to how to take security to the next level and then he found my book and he said he went through it and it was like a light bulb went on for him and he went back to school for data analysis and and just like it, it changed his whole career tra trajectory and and I thought wow that's that's you know, I'm done at that point like you know I, I so. I've still to achieve that point so no life yeah. change yet so yeah but, but so it's beautiful but that, that was this is amazing feedback, i think nice. yes yeah. and you know we get a lot of people um saying that the book uh helped show them things that that they didn't even realize was out there you know right. the, the, some of the tools some of the techniques um yeah and i think that's probably the number one piece of feedback that we've gotten is just that that the book showed them things that they didn't realize were were out there, and that was really the the whole purpose of it. It's just take people from nothing to something. Right. You know. And 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 where can where, where can um, users find this book? Um, it's uh, through Wiley Publishing, and so it should be okay. everywhere. It's on Amazon. So. Okay. Interesting. Anywhere fine books are sold. <laughs> okay. Interesting. So now now let's let's get to some of some of your fun topics uh security so yeah. um, and um let's let's talk about um how secure is a typical business today what's what's your what's your perception uh so that's uh, i uh i think the easy answer is uh probably not very secure um you know for for a long time at, at verizon for example we studied breaches and and so we we were inundated with all of the different types of failures that occur and the, the common thread among all of them is that in hindsight looking at these they were all because of very very simple things you know mm. it was uh, bad password selection uh, you know trying to fix uh, something that has been patched for years and that mm. patch was just never applied uh, you know just some basic 
things that most security people learn in like their first year working anywhere near security just to do these simple things and a lot of them stem from that now that's in hindsight mm. you know in reality as a company is looking at their network and they've got I don't know how many of our computers are on there from from dozens to, to hundreds of thousands uh, and essentially you're inundated with this huge list mm. of super easy things to fix but you've got a huge list of them how do you prioritize how do you fix that and so it's very easy in hindsight to say do all these simple things you know companies are extremely vulnerable mm. uh, and, and everyone should focus on the easy things but in reality there's a huge long list of easy things and and how do you get through them all um, and that never seems to end so uh, yeah I think uh, companies have have some opportunities to grow in the mm. security realm mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time it's it, it's very difficult to make smart decisions in the current we'll resume after a short break this part of the program is sponsored by job fair at tau.ai to learn more go to job fair that's j o b f a i r dot t a o dot ai a fastest ai driven way to help you find your next job do check them out let's get back to the podcast environment interesting interesting so what what are some of the suggestions that companies companies could do uh, to at least start this journey of at least understanding the risk and 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 started being secure so what are some of some of the key takeaway or key thoughts that comes to your mind for a totally a newbie in this in this arena yeah so you know i think anytime you you get into security you're going to get a, a a large selection of advice um right and pretty much in, all the advice that you'll get initially is is going to be pretty good hmm. uh, you know it's like strong passwords don't click on attachments and you know i mean just stuff like that and um again it's harder to do that in practice uh, very easy to get that advice uh, but I think for companies starting out um, I think that the one thing I would recommend actually is to to go out to Verizon and search for the data breach investigations report hmm. uh, it is it's from a vendor it's from Verizon and their their uh, business services hmm. but it's not it's not there to promote Verizon directly uh, and so we worked very hard to make that very independent research and very focused and so what that research does though and you can download the reports I think it's in the 10th year now mm. uh, but you can download that report and just glance through it even just looking at the pictures in there the plots and the graphics and you get a feel for what's going on in the industry what companies are falling falling prey to and their attacks and things like that and that just helps people get sort of a general idea of what's going on in the world of breaches and security incidents interesting so um let's let's dig a bit deeper into this so mm -hmm. uh, if suppose i'm a business today and 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 i think thanks for some suggestions that um, uh, some of the initial areas where i can I, I can do i can do research on what's going on and, and what to do what are some of the some of the good investments i could i so if suppose um, i could do um, to secure my my infrastructure so yeah. what are some of the things so the, the first thing that i think would want to establish is what what industry you're in and and mm. and what are the the things that y your company is focusing on for example uh, a retail chain a retail store has a much different threat profile than say mm. a bank versus a, a manufacturing company um, and so just understanding that first so like in in retail and uh, some of the hospitality stuff restaurants and hotels the attacker is generally going to go after payment card information mm. They're going to want something uh, that they can turn around and sell, make money. It's a very financially motivated uh, threat actor in, mm -hmm. in retail and things like that. Same thing in a bank, but they're they're much less interested, of course, in payment cards, and they're going mm -hmm. after the actual money in bank accounts. And banks have some of the the better security because they've been under attack for so long. Mm -hmm. They've they've been able to mature at a little faster rate than some of the other industries. Uh, but just understanding. Like where where are the sensitive assets that that your company has, and, and what are the attackers most likely going to go after, and that that helps shape the priority. Interesting, then. interesting. So, so basically, moni monitoring your internal traffic will give some some segue into what's going on, and that will yeah, or just just understanding what data you have and, mm -hmm. and what kind of data attackers are going after. Interesting, interesting, and um, so um, I think one thing that that we hear a lot from our end. Uh, uh, many of the businesses that we talk to about security, and I think they're they 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 get anxious about hey, 
all i can pictures when i am thinking about security is my it guy saying not don't do this don't do that right right so yeah. that's typically against the wisdom of doing business so either i should do business or i should i should listen to the it guy so what are some right. of your some of your thoughts on how to fix that problem right of um, yeah it's that that is a huge challenge because um, security people are trained to see you know th- this is what they spend their time learning is is seeing all the ways that things can go wrong right uh, but the challenge is that uh, a lot of the security people will see things that they know will go wrong or could mm. go wrong if someone was trying to attack them uh, but then that there's that element of risk that I think is a, a challenging thing so for example if you're in retail and, and you see I don't know uh, something uh, a system that's printing documents on the side or something and and you know that that has an exposure they may focus on that and say no you can't bring that in here or something like that but but the threat profile would say that that probably is not where attackers are going to go after and if right. you can just you know um and so there's it's a give and take on both sides i think i think security people are very prone to saying no mm-hmm. uh, especially some of the younger uh and people new to the field they're very prone to saying no uh and i think that they need to help you know they need to educate themselves as well about risk analysis and the actual exposure and the priorities uh but at the same time the business also needs to understand that there probably are some things that might be too great of risk um but it's always you know it's always a a risk trade off it's you know um are we okay with this level of exposure and this level of possible loss and things like that um and i think i think we're very young in that in that evolution right now trying to quantify and communicate how much mm-hmm. exposure actually exists and so i th- i think it is a problem and i think it's something that both sides have to grow and educate themselves on and and talk about it quite openly because to your point business are are there to take risks right, right. They're, they're not going to make money if they're not taking risks that's true um, mm-hmm. interesting yeah. interesting so um let's talk about your experience in in this industry like what are some of some of some of your challenges uh, as a practitioner that 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 like uh, that just stands out for you uh yeah boy there's there's a lot of challenges um <laughs> not sure quite where to start on that one the, <laughs> i mean there, there's a lot of things both from just an, an education perspective mm. um not only like i mentioned the the security people i think have have some educating to do of themselves mm. about these concepts of risk and and data analysis and things like that mm. uh but also the people uh in companies working with security people working with any sort of assets in the company uh have some education to do as well but that's sort of a slippery slope but some of the actual technical challenges in this industry is that coming by any sort of labeled data set is probably one of the the bigger challenges for data analysis in this industry mm-hmm. um because if you take for example breaches uh, as we're studying breaches and we're looking at what might contribute to them Mm. Uh you can go to public sources and so for example 48 states have a data breach notification law. Mm. And and uh you can do FOIA requests, the Freedom of Information Request Act to these states and and say please give me the the breach data that has been submitted to to your attorney general mm. and most of the states will will uh, agree to that request and but well, what you're getting then is a biased data set of companies that are familiar with those data breach notification right. laws chose to submit it uh you know and things like that and so a lot of the smaller companies may not know to submit so you're getting mainly larger companies and you're only getting uh breaches that affect citizens in that state you know as, as opposed to a theft of intellectual property and uh denial of service attack for you have a loss of availability so you're just getting a slice of breach data and there's other ways to get other breach data but all of it is coming with its own bias. And so as we're working with breaches for example as a as a target variable, the one thing we know, we know who's been breached or mm-hmm. we don't know. Right? So it's a it's sort of a one class problem. All we know is that these were breached and the other ones we're not so sure about. Interesting. Um, and so it's a it's a huge challenge. Interesting. And and what are some of the pleasant surprises that that you get uh being a practitioner in the industry like that hey businesses get it or something like what you don't have to do as much of yeah. hand holding as possible i think i think some of my more pleasant moments have been uh, lately i've been able to work with insurance companies uh nice. and actuaries and uh talking risk with them has been <laughs> a, a complete joy uh cuz 
you know, when I talk to security people about risk, there's all sorts of groundwork that has right. to be laid about probability. And, you know, when I, when I say prediction, I don't mean like you will meet a tall, dark stranger. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, there's a 10% chance of X. Uh, and so there's all these groundworks, but talking to actuaries in the insurance industry, talk about probability and it's like, just get on to the actual subject. Don't, you know, you don't have to explain anything. Let's just right. talk about risk. Let's nice. talk about that exposure. So. Interesting. Interesting. So um, regarding, so you, you, uh, let's talk about the business a bit more. So one thing that, that, that we have seen, so the moment something is more convoluted or something that's difficult to explain, mm -hmm businesses put a financial problem, a financial solution on it. Okay, I'll, I'll just calculate the risk of occurrence and just pay it off and just, I don't have to fix anything. And I, I can pretty okay. much live free and just fix. What do you think about that? Uh, that how, how, like, how far are we from uh, this uh, risk or this sort of uh, security being a financial problem rather than really an IT solution? Well, I think I think that companies are already treating it like that, and um, to try and try and combat the the lack of security, I think what we see is a lot of investment and in, and in products, and you know, so like um, companies will go out and just buy solutions off the shelf, hoping mm -hmm. that they're going to reduce their exposure and things like that. Um, and it's a it's sort of a interesting uh, mix right now for the vendors in this space. There's a a large quantity of vendors just continually trying to sell. Hey, this is going to solve this or that. You know, if there's if there's ever an event in the security industry, for example, a large uh, public breach or something, there's a whole flurry of marketing people jumping on it, saying, "Hey, our product has solved that." You know, and it, it, mm -hmm. sometimes it's things that have nothing to do with the actual event, and they're saying that anyway. Um, you know, so it's a it's a hard challenge, and and so companies are treating it like a financial problem, saying. You know, let's just throw more money at it, and, and you know, our security group can go buy some products. We'll throw them in, and we should be good, right? Yeah. Um, and it's just that's it, it works to some extent, but I think that we need to be smarter about it. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of the, the challenges come in in the industry is trying to know which products are going to help, uh, which products you should even focus on in the first place. I think is a challenge. Interesting, interesting. And 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 so, um, what about um, so? get like how far are we from uh, security being that predictable that we can ensure that insurance companies could jump in and say okay i can ensure your setup if you comply to these standards or whatever it's like how far are what's your perception on that well they're doing it now i mean you can buy insurance uh, against breaches and and things like that um and so they're doing it now uh, but i think uh, i think most uh, carriers would would agree that um they're, they're still very young in that process. Mm. And so because uh, they, they struggle trying to, trying to rate the risk of companies, mm. um, they, they are overpricing the policies, uh, trying, trying to hedge their bets. Uh, and so it's, it's a really interesting time in the insurance industry because you've got a, a, lot of actuary, like a lot of actuaries coming at this problem and trying to figure out how are they going to price this and, and things like that. Um, and so it's a very exciting time because I think this is really where the security industry is going to be moved, sort of pulled along with the insurance industry. Because mm. um, I think the insurance industry is going to make some great strides in understanding risk and trying to quantify and communicate risk. Interesting. So I, I, I think a couple of months back, I had this conversation with one of the chief financial officer of a company. And pretty much like we were debating between, so we we're talking about this, uh, the idea of risk and where the risk hits the most is it really it or it's really the the cfo uh, so charter and and there was sort of some conversation on whether cfo should own the idea of risk or whether whether sort of uh, it's along the same line of hey if it, if i can ensure i can pack it up uh, i and i can pretty much pay it to do it or whether it's it's a cio's uh, bucket so do you have any perspective on that like where where um, they should fall yeah i, I think uh I think ultimately the risk decision is a, a, a business decision mm -hmm. uh, and a financial decision, uh, but it's very, very difficult to get to that point mm -hmm. uh, to make to make a very, very informed decision right now is, is a, a huge challenge. And so but but security is, you know, 90 percent technical at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the CIO has a, a very, very direct hand uh, in the security of the company and 
you know, what solutions are put in place, what, what gets funded, what doesn't. And uh, so I think the CIO is a very hands-on uh, influencer in the security, but I think the CFO definitely has a, a seat at that table as to the direction and, and uh, business decisions around risk acceptance versus uh, transference versus, uh, you know, all that. Interesting, interesting. So, if suppose if if I'm a bus, I, if I'm a business right now, and I want to un, un measure the risk of my infrastructure. So, I think you uh, you pointed out some interesting thoughts that hey, no, uh, understand your data, understand your sort of workflows and all that, tap it up. But like, if I need to put up a team together, like what's the what's the shortest and the best way for me to audit my setup? Um, if like, do you have any any thoughts on those? There's, yeah, there's a there's a whole range of uh, different frameworks that you could follow and things like that. Um, ISO, COBIT. Uh, there's a new NIST, the the what is it? National Institute of Science Tech, Tech Technologies for Governments, hmm. um, and that's that's a government thing. But um, they came out with uh, what's called cybersecurity framework, Interesting. and uh, largely they just say you know like here are the things you should be focusing on, and some of them are are quite detailed. Um, if you're dealing with payment cards, for example, you've got the PCI standard. If you're in healthcare, you've got HIPAA. And all of these are going to recommend um, either very specific things or general things. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, advice and frameworks and, and things <coughs> out there that you can focus on. Interesting. I think you um, you brought up an interesting point, by the way. So HIPAA and all these standards, right, that are out there today, so uh, I was I was talking to someone from actually from uh, healthcare industry and they're saying uh, so one of the thought was uh, this IT guy was saying that these standards actually they create more problem than they solve something right they create sort of they sometimes these standards are not compliant to each other so you have to create this mid layer and, and then the moment you start uh, getting these different standards you start seeing those cracks that is pretty much uh, yeah. difficult to keep a tap on so how to solve that problem of multiple standards uh, and then like it's it's trade has been always a one of the biggest vulnerability for any business right and these standards come from the trade side so what are what are what are your some of the some of the thoughts on um, how to go about that yeah it's a million dollar question if if we could solve that it would it'd be a great business <laughs> idea um, yeah no it's a huge challenge um, and you'll get like especially so, some of the uh, financial industry has just a huge range of regulatory and other compliance frameworks and just a you know uh, when i worked in in industry it just seemed like every every month that was like a new new auditor is coming in to look at this and to validate mm. this and um just constant thing it's just a barrage and um it's very tricky and i think companies are sort of getting through it in sort of a brute force way like they're just they're dealing with it as best they can and and so one more thing that I've seen then that from from the innovation side. So if something is too new for you to understand, so there's there's a tendency to create a center of excellence or sort of creating a best practices guide or something. Are, are you seeing something similar in your in your industry as well? Yeah, and I, I would consider it a huge problem actually. Um, the and this was I think that people are starting to move away from the the concept of a best practice. Hmm. Uh, because what what happened and and what we saw happening is that they would come out people would come out with these lists of here are best practices hmm. and what ended up happening is companies were, were trying to put these best practices in but they're realizing that they're spending money and they're spending effort on things that are not actually reducing their risk given hmm. their threat profile and their environment and things like that and so the, the environment is just too complex to have any sort of list of best practices at this point there's just too many uncertainties and the and the threat the threat profile for different companies it's just there's so much variation and so to talk about a, a best practice you almost have to say here are the best practices for this size of company in this particular mm. industry uh working with this type of customer and data you know and then you might be able to get some hint of a best practice list uh but the problem with talking all companies should do these things uh, it becomes very problematic, and, and especially as you get down more and more detailed, you start having companies spending on things that just aren't changing their profile. Interesting, and I think what, one one more interesting thing that that I have observed from from a from a strategy side of of business is the maturity model, 
right so it it gives kind it gives you a pathway it gives you a direction of okay where are you when probably where you're heading to so right. do you have some maturity model uh, in in the security side of the business as well when and if you can shed some light on that yeah and it's very nascent um mm. and a lot of the you know like if you talk about uh, uh, area of security called vendor risk management you know where mm. a company will work with dozens or hundreds of companies mm. and share data and access and things and they want to understand that that company is going to do well right going to mm. treat their data well going to treat the access perfect and and mm. so they put out these surveys and often they're trying to ask those sort of things what is your maturity in this area when you know how mature are your policies and things like that and and trying to to take those answers and, and draw anything from that uh very very difficult but like covid and iso a lot of those will focus on the maturity concepts and try to mm. rate it but again a lot of it is so subjective and they they rely on experts to say well in policies you know we're uh what is it repeated you know our processes are repeatable Uh, mm. but you know if you get another person and they they missed lunch for whatever reason they might say oh we're completely immature you know and so it's it's a very very subjective thing um and it's it's a pretty big challenge actually trying to trying to get people to assess the maturity of their organization as a whole and even individual parts it's a, it's a huge challenge interesting interesting so 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 basically you're saying that cobit and all these so there are some frameworks that 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 pretty yeah. much point you to some direction of where you are and where you are heading to interesting yeah. interesting so now let's let's talk about data scientist um in mm-hmm. security what does that really means if if you can shed some light on that there's there's two i i would say there's like two types um and the majority of them are focused on very much the the tactical trying to catch the bad guys you know so it's trying to uh detect malware for example or detect botnet communication detect uh, uh system modification uh user behavior analytics uh you know trying to catch when a employee is doing something out of out of the ordinary and things like mm-hmm. that and these are all very tactical they're all there to try and detect when when a, a system is going from an, a good operational state to a, a possible uh, compromised state um and try to reduce the exposure and try to s- prevent uh, attacks from happening in the first place i would say it's a, probably most of what data science and security is focused on and then there's sort of the side aspect that i spend a lot of my time on is trying to understand in the big picture uh you know so i'm not going to be able to predict the one next breach mm. but i could probably describe the next 1000 breaches that are going to occur and that's sort of that bigger picture and that's what i like to focus on but a lot of the data science right now in security is very heavily focused on and helping the the security analyst the boots on the ground to do their job more efficiently more effectively and to give them more information interesting so um i think i i, I definitely want to delve into a bit more on the paranoia of security right that so what is the, what is the lower and 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 the higher limit so if the moment uh, you see something you say hey this is like too this is too unsecure for me to engage or this is say you guys are just overkilling yeah. it you don't have to just go that crazy on that So what are like right. is there any any such limitation that you say okay if you're done this then you are like I I would you it's a pass you can survive Yeah Yeah and there's it's very difficult because that conversation is happening right now and people are making those decisions right now with very very little data mm-hmm. um and so it's it's a it's a really interesting uh, time to work in the in the field uh and and one of the things that that I've learned from insurance actually is this concept of a loss exceedance curve right mm-hmm. which has two elements to it you know how often something is going to occur in other words the probability of the event is it a, a like a 1 in 10 year event 1 in 100 mm-hmm. year event and then what what are the the probability that that loss would exceed some amount so like a 1 in 10 year event may exceed a 1 million dollar loss for example and i think having that level of information i think that we're a ways away from that in most of the decisions but like that that's sort of our target right cuz um and that's what you're saying like there's a lower limit for example if it's a a one in a thousand year event and we're only going to lose you know we might exceed 50 bucks or something right. like there's no way you should put another dollar into that but if you've got another thing where it's you know a one in two year event and it's going to exceed 10 million dollars in losses uh, probably uh, that's something you'd focus on interesting so so, so, but, so basically there there is something like an impact uh, impact versus um, uh, sort of complexity map that that pretty much you you, you could use yeah. 
to find the right, right. problem to actually go after. Interesting. Yeah. I think that's actually a very, very clever way. Uh, yeah. Makes sense. So yeah, so le- now let's talk about, um, so some of the interesting reads. Uh, so I have no clue what, what I'm talking uh, when it comes to security. Where should I start? Um, so I mentioned the, the Verizon Data Breach Investigations yeah. Report. I think that's a, a great resource for getting some of the concepts and things like that. And and uh, I think uh, all the all the even going back in time in that, uh, you know, I think the for me the highlight was the 2014 report. Um, but I think just doing that get get some good good stuff in there um, for people actually possibly looking at getting into the field. There's a, a several certifications that you can go through. The, the most prominent is called the CISSP. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of study guides out there and that does a, a good job at, uh, I think they describe that as like a mile wide and an inch deep. Uh, and so that's what CISSP is designed to give that huge broad overview. But, you know, I mean, the study book is a three inch book or something like that. Um, so, but I, yeah, I think some of the industry reports are, are industri- interesting as well. So like Verizon and things like that, but they, all of these uh, different vendors will, will try to give their own perspective and usually in, and mostly a, a vendor agnostic way. Um, so I think those are good resources too. Interesting. Um, uh, makes sense. So if suppose um, I'm a business, right? And I, and, 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 and I want to now start investing in this idea of security. I want to hire one guy what would be the first what would that first guy look like do you have a perception on that yeah it would be and and there's a there's a um skills shortage in the industry mm. so finding a good security person is um uh, a little bit more difficult now mm. uh, but it would be it would be someone uh you know you could you could say i'm looking for a cissp for example someone who's mm. been through that certification process uh, and that is often one of the first things that people will look for in a security person um, but it's not it's not required by any stretch. Um, there's other certifications as well. Uh, but looking for someone who's you know, if you're looking for to try and jumpstart something, you probably want someone with some experience. So mm-hmm. looking for people who've been working in the security industry, preferably in your field, uh, whatever business in you're in, uh, working in that because that, you know, if you're working in healthcare, healthcare has their own set of challenges for security. Having someone who's worked in security and healthcare before would really help jumpstart that program. Interesting, so. interesting. So on, on, on the same note, um, if uh, besides your broke data driven security, any other read that you could suggest to our audience that uh, they could they could read? Yeah, well, I, it's not a true security book. Uh, but by far, my, my most favorite book is a book called uh, Against the Gods. Uh, mm. And it's a, a, the subtitle is like the remarkable story or history of risk. And, uh, and, and the author goes through the, the history, the historical concept of risk and how it has evolved and you know the, the generation of probability theory and so on and so forth. But I mean, the title Against the Gods comes from back in the day when they used to roll the bones, as they say, there were little <laughs> ankle bones that they used as right. dice. Uh, and, and of course, nobody tried to figure out the probability of these dice coming up with some things because that would be going against the gods because the gods determine the outcome of the dice. Uh, so there's no sense for probability or risk or anything like that. Um, and so that's where the title comes from. But it's a, it's a fantastic book. And it doesn't, it's not directly related to security, uh, but it's more about this concept of risk. And, and that's what I really like about it. I think um, that sounds, I'll, I'll probably add it to my list. So uh, sounds good, actually. So um, now uh, let's, let's talk about some of the interesting companies doing interesting work in security. Like, do you have any favorites that, that, that you want to call out? Yeah, uh, and uh, you mentioned in my bio that I'm also working for a company called Bitsight, um, right. and I, I I joined them for a reason that I think that they're doing some of the some really interesting work uh, in the industry, um, and it, it's sort of a but but in the across the industry there's a it's sort of a double edged sword like I really want people to start using uh, uh, you know artificial intelligence machine learning really start bringing data science directly into the conversation about security, but we also have this completely uncontrolled Wild West environment where someone creates a series of if-then statements and they call it machine learning. Right. Uh, you know, and so it's a, it, it's sort of a challenge. Like you really want people to adopt this technology and get it in place and, and bring this technology in the environments, but then you've got people selling, you know, labeling things as machine learning and advanced artificial intelligence and deep 
neural networks and I mean just some crazy crazy marketing stuff out there and so it's kind of hard like I don't know it, it's hard to uh, to discern what's what's valid and, and what's snake oil no I think and that's that's even like even even what we are seeing from our industry that AI and machine learning is almost so much engraved in the in in, in the trendy words nowadays that yeah. Some like it's it's I think it's it's getting harder for businesses and and I like I think that's uh, from the security side when when the the anxiety is pretty high that whether I'm secure or not if you're s selling snake oil it's just getting more terrifying um, yeah. for for sure in, yeah and in, a lot of companies will use fear to try and sell you know they'll true. say hey so and so was breached that could be you you know yeah, right. so it's 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 so yeah I think that that brings up to my my. Uh, we're actually on, on almost the tail end of the, of that. So, uh, brings me to the point of um, what's next uh, in the world of security. Like, what are, what are your some of your prophecies, or what what some of the things that you are seeing happening, which is exciting, that we should keep an eye on. Do you have any perception on that? One of the things that I'm kind of excited about is is sort of this growing trend of um, even just like basic statistical techniques. Like, forget the really great machine learning stuff. Like. You know the the trend of security practitioners to actually use data and even just do some basic descriptive statistics on events or anything that they're looking at trying to trying to leverage the data more um, whereas in the past we'd see people sort of you know just sort of sit back in their chair and look at their environment and be like ah, i think this is going on mm. uh, and so i we're seeing that trend of of more people starting to you know, throw data even to an Excel or something like that, you know, just a basic spreadsheet just to get some basic visualizations out of their data or something. Um, and so I really like seeing that trend. Um, and then I also like seeing that there is that trend of machine learning and things like mm. that and some of these products uh, that will absolutely benefit from it. Right. You know, like antivirus, for example, for years it was based on static signatures you know you get a piece of malware mm. and they would look at the, the hash of that you know the signature of it and then that would get distributed on these long lists of signatures uh, and most of the antivirus nowadays uh, are still doing that to some extent but they they have to work more to try and understand the behavior of malware now and and they're mm. employing machine learning and uh, deep learning and trying to understand what what actually makes malware and trying to classify it and they're getting some really good classification engines now for for malware and things like that so i'm excited about seeing the the uh, the, the math being used in that way uh, and i think that'll great greatly help the defender interesting interesting and uh, thank you for sharing that so we are we are at the end of the conversation so uh, joy thank you so much uh, for, for spending time and i think before before we part ways i i would love for you to have a closing remark for our audience, uh, um, if if you may. Sure. Yeah. So one thing I want to talk about is is hiring data science and security just real quick, mm -hmm. um, because when we're when you're trying to hire someone in security uh, to do data science or to bring some of these analytic techniques into a company, there's basically two types that that we find. One is a security person trying to be an analysis, you know, doing the data analysis, and the other one is someone already skilled mm -hmm. in data science trying to come into security. Um, it's very rare that you get a blend of both of those. And mm. so if you're already a data scientist and you're looking for an exciting field, think about coming over into security. Um, there's definitely a learning curve, but it's it's really well worth it. And if you're a security person watching this, think about trying to expand your, your skill set and get into data science. And I think that the industry and, and companies and the, the Internet as a whole would benefit from more people coming into this industry and trying to apply data science to, to security. Interesting. Well said. I think uh, I, I couldn't have said any better. So again, Jay, thank you so much for, for spending time with our, our community, sharing some good insights on data security. Love to have you back again after some interesting uh, more hacks uh, revealed and probably share your insights on what's going on. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I thought I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it Then I go into the booth feeling nervous Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless Is the mic on? I don't know how to work this Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on the side